Okay, I guess we'll get started um, kind of on time for once. Um, so today's lecture is about um, uh, the second kind of set of uh, history uh, about, and uh, normally I would have had this, you know, right after the first lecture about history, but I wanted to get in, you know, Jeff's talk about how to um, do the homework. Uh, so that brings us to announcements. Um, remember that the first homework is due a week from today, uh, right before class, and immediately at 1.30 it'll be late. Uh, so, you know, definitely turn it in uh, before that. Um, I decided to have office hours myself, um, and so tentatively those are on Tuesdays uh, starting tomorrow uh, from 3 to 4. If you would like to have it some other time, just send me an email or you know, if I should have it some other time every week, uh, let me know what would work out better. Uh, don't forget, Jeff has office hours every Wednesday, uh, starting last week. I don't think anybody showed up, but um, you're definitely welcome to um, go to his office then. Uh, just another reminder, I sent everybody an email um, that you're supposed to do the required readings um, before each class, uh, and occasionally there'll be quizzes, approximately eight, throughout the term. Uh, and the guest lectures next week, we have some pretty amazing people uh, coming to talk. Uh, on Monday, it'll be um, David Canfield Smith, who was one of the inventors of the word icons, uh, one of the chief designers of the Xerox star. And uh, then on Wednesday, we have Larry Tesler, who invented copy and paste. So that's pretty incredible that the person who invented that interaction technique is going to be talking to to us, um, and he also was the head of the uh, development for the Xerox, I mean for the Apple Macintosh uh, and the Lisa. So a lot of the interactions that we're all familiar with, he had a hand in. Um, and they've asked that you read the required readings that are listed for them so that they can have more of a discussion. Uh, Larry will give kind of a more formal talk that he gave uh, Two years ago, when he won an award uh, honoring his uh, incredibly long, you know, uh, life of influence, uh, but David on Monday said that he would much prefer to be more interactive and question and answer. He's been retired for five or six years. Uh, he spent the last four years in a min in a uh, they sold their house and got a motor home and has been driving around the West taking some really amazing pictures. So he's been kind of out of the scene for quite a long time. Uh, doesn't have, doesn't want to make a PowerPoint presentation or anything. And it's really uh, very nice that he's willing to talk to us at all because he's really been out of the community for a while. Uh, but he said, you know, he's kind of back home now and is happy to help me out because we collaborated over the years. So he wants it to be more interactive. So it'll help if you've read the material that he uh, cited, uh, which is a chapter of a book. Okay, um, any questions about logistics or anything? Everybody doing okay? Uh, some people have been posting things on Piazza and, and Jeff and I have been, well, I've been answering. Jeff hasn't answered anything yet. So uh, as you get into the homeworks, uh, please, you know, post there and that way everybody else in the class can benefit from the answers if they're confused about the same thing. Um, sorry about the website going down. Uh, that happens. You know, it was actually the whole CS server went down for a little while. Uh, if you want to take the Fitz Law page, for example, it's just one HTML page. If you store it on your local computer, then you can have a local copy in case that happens again. Uh, you know, like if you were going to test somebody and it didn't work. Uh, there were still a couple of people who hadn't entered their uh, devices into the web page. So I hope that doesn't mean that you're planning to leave the homework until next weekend, you probably won't be able to finish it in time. So definitely you should uh, be planning to do the homework all this week if you hadn't started already. Anything else? I think that's all I have for announcements. Okay, so why are we talking about handheld devices? Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, information. I really like this chart on the left, uh, kind of shows the um, <laughs> percent of all computing uh, and what sort of, you know, devices it was done on. And this big blue area is 
Windows, right? And so, and the uh, the Macintosh is, or Apple is this thin red area, which has surprisingly stayed approximately the same percent throughout the years, right? So it's kind of the same width up here uh, when the Macintosh was released as it is over here now that, um, you know, we have the Macintosh and iPhone and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of other computing. These were mainframes and things like Digital Equipment Corporation, mini computers and all sorts of things, all of which pretty much disappeared. Uh, Commodore was kind of a hobbyist computer. The TRS-80 is a Radio Shack computer. All of these kind of hobbyist computers disappeared as well. And pretty much everything was replaced with Windows computers for quite a long time. So this is like 83 to 2009. And of course, what's happening now is that less than half of the computing devices that people are using are computers anymore. And they've been significantly replaced by phones, uh, most of them are Android. And that's also shown over here, kind of the same uh, information. The green bars are um, smartphones, the yellow part are tablets, and then the red and blue are uh, desktop PCs and notebook PCs. And you can see that in 2010 was the last year that uh, smartphones and other kinds of portable devices were smaller than uh, desktop computers. And there's no reason to think that this is not just going to keep dominating. So clearly, you know, computing and, you know, computation and web accessing, anything you want to measure is now dominated by portable devices, phones, and um, and I think an interesting thing is that the, it doesn't mean that these numbers have decreased very much, right? So it's pretty flat. So the things that people are using their desktop and laptops for, they still need to use those, right? So if you're writing a w Microsoft Word document or when you're writing the report for this class, you're probably going to want to use your desktop or laptop computer. Uh, you're probably not going to write that on your phone. Um, but every, there are all sorts of new uses that are um, you know, being taken up by computation. And that, you'll see, is part of the history as well. So going way back, uh, this is 1964. That's quite a long time ago. Um, people had the idea that handwriting would be a good thing for computers to be able to understand. And so uh, RAND, which is a research uh, lab, and there's a, actually a Pittsburgh branch of RAND, if you've noticed, it's on top, it's right next to the SCI building on the corner of, uh, uh, well, I care for, it's like on Craig Street. Uh, there's a RAND building. Um, it's a, a research lab that's been around for quite a long time, and they do all sorts of mostly government-sponsored research. Uh, way back in the 60s, uh, they were doing a significant amount of computer research, and they invented one of the first tablets where you could write with a pen. This doesn't have anything to do with portable devices. Obviously, in 64, there was nothing like a portable computer. Uh, it's connected to this enormous monitor, and the tablet itself was this really large, uh, heavy thing. Uh, but it was the first time that you could draw with a pen on the, on the table. Uh, and remember, uh, last time we talked about light pens, and they could only see where the dots already were on the screen, so they were okay for selecting things that were there. But you couldn't use something like that to handwrite because clearly you're trying to write everywhere, not necessarily where there were things on the screen. So they needed a new kind of technology, and this tablet was magnetic uh, and you know, used various techniques to let you uh, do data entry. Uh, and this, tab this uh, paper, the 64 paper, actually invented the term pen computing. Uh, so that's a really old term as well. Uh, and there are patents from this time and even earlier that recognize things like mechanisms for doing hand printing recognition. Uh, so that was pretty well established quite early. Uh, of course, there's all sorts of ambu ambiguity and, uh, you know, letters, you know, A's and D's and, you know, all sorts of letters when you handwrite them look the same. Uh, and of course, it's much worse with handwriting 
you know, if we write in script, uh, that's also really hard to recognize. And so there's been enormous amounts of work. I just have one reference here, but there's been enormous amounts of work in recognizing, handwriting, hand printing, all sorts of things like that. I'm not going to cover any of that. Just uh, kind of background knowledge that that's been going on for quite a long time. And um, the assumption was, you know, that people would like to handwrite, and that would be a kind of a useful way of, you know, entering data into a computer. Another thing that happened quite early was programmable calculators. How many people had one in high school? Most people still do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, the idea was that you know it would be easier to do computations, and the original ones of these were pretty expensive in the hundreds of dollars, but they're still a lot cheaper than a computer. Um, so for a long time, uh, it made sense economically to get something like this to do your computation on. And uh, uh, eventually, they added more and more built-in functions, and eventually they enabled you to write little programs for it. Uh, and so that's another way that you could get kind of computation on the go. Uh, nothing much of interest in terms of interaction techniques, so we won't cover it very much. Basically, it just had buttons. Uh, nothing much of interest there. Uh, they had displays, and eventually they had a graphing calculator, uh, 85. Uh, so that would have a bigger display where you could put little graphs and charts instead of just number entry. This was the, one of the original calculators with a red display. Anybody ever seen one of those? Uh, that predates uh, the original calculators. When I was in high school, that would have been like 72. Um, the first calculators came out. My uncle worked for Texas Instruments, which invented the first calculator. It was like $100, and it just did arithmetic, plus and minus and stuff. And the display was this red LED, which used a lot of batteries. Um, and it would basically go through the batteries in like a few weeks. Um, so eventually, they invented LCD displays, and you know, the battery problem went away, and they could do better uh, displays. Uh, for a while, there were two competing main vendors of programmable calculators, Texas Instruments from Texas, no surprise there, and uh, Hewlett Packard from California. And Hewlett Packard was making people use this uh, syntax for data entry called reverse Polish notation, RPN, um, or postfix notation. Uh, and it was really bizarre. You know, if you, wa if you wanted to do 4 plus 5 times 6, there's this ambiguity of when should the operation happen, right? Is this 4 times 6 plus 4, or 4 plus 5 times 6? And obviously, you get different answers. Uh, so the TI calculators had to have parentheses. Uh, in order to be able to say what you meant, or else you had to do things in a different order. Uh, in reverse Polish notation, the operator always goes last. Um, and so a plus takes two arguments. So this is 4 or 5 plus, so it'll, do, it'll get 9, and then 6 times 9, right? So that's the same answer. And if you wanted the other order, you would just say 4 or 5, 6 plus times. Right, because plus would take the first two arguments off the stack, so that would do five plus. Uh, let's see, what do we want? Oh, we we want uh, four plus five times six, so that would be four five six times plus. Right, so you have to do things in a backwards order. That's why it's called reverse. Um, the advantage is you don't need parentheses, but you know the syntax is really uh, bizarre and unusual. And we'll see in a few weeks when we start talking about computer operations, that this idea of having infix versus postfix versus prefix is an important consideration when you're doing operations with the mouse as well. So um, not much of interest in the calculator world, so we'll uh, leave that and go into kind of the what's now called ubiquitous computing uh, era. and. We talked uh, last time about how Xerox PARC had this enormous influence on the um, way we all do desktop computing, on you know, all the interaction techniques we use uh, with Alto and then with the star, uh, all that important research uh, that was done there. 
And it turns out that uh, Xerox PARC had another totally separate enormous influence uh, in the 80s with this ubiquitous computing uh, research. So in the 70s, they invented the desktop and the desktop interactions. And in the late 80s and 90s, they again had this enormous uh, resurgence of influence in something that uh, Mark Weiser coined. He made up the term ubiquitous computing. Uh, Mark was a really nice guy. Uh, he was about my age, and he died very young. Uh, he died at 46 of cancer, um, which was a real shame. Uh, he had been at the University of Maryland and then moved to Xerox Park, did a bunch of important research there. He had this idea that, um, you know, the era of just doing everything on laptops or desktops was about to be over, and that we should be looking at how you could do interactions in different ways. And his idea was that there are th basically different fundamental sizes for human uh, interaction. One is the size of your hand, one is the size of your forearm, and the other is kind of the wall, right? Um, <clears throat> and so he uh, had these uh, three different sizes. He called them boards, pads, and tabs. Boards, pads, and tabs, kind of in the opposite order. Um, and then he wrote these two really influential articles in Scientific American and CACM that uh, kind of set, across, set, set out his vision of how you would use these different kinds of technologies. Um, and he thought that everyone would have hundreds of these, tens of these, and one or two of these. Okay, so that obviously didn't happen. Uh, everybody has one of each. Or uh, how many people have a tablet and a smartphone and a regular computer? So lots of you, okay. Anybody have hundreds of these? No, right? That, that didn't happen, obviously. But uh, now we often have one of each of these. And so, you know, his vision of what sort of things you would want to do on each of these kind of things <clears throat> obviously had enormous kind of influence. Um, we still rarely interact together on a big screen. Um, certainly there are things like that. There's something called a smart board. Anybody have a smart board in their high school? Yeah, so um, a lot of American high schools ended up with a, a board that you can write on on the wall. Um, most people don't, can't think of anything useful to do with it, so they're really not that effective. Uh, the concept is that you would collaborate around them like you would around a whiteboard, uh, but in general, people still prefer you know, regular whiteboards than computerized ones. The park tab, there really weren't very many good pictures of it. It was monochrome, green and black. Uh, it was really hard to take pictures of it, so there's, it's really hard to see what the screen looked like. Um, was much more influential than the other two devices, uh, as we'll see. And it's also more relevant to this talk anyway. Uh, so they didn't really do much of interest with the tablet computer. Uh, pretty much the same kind of thing everybody else was doing. Nothing much of interest really happened from Xerox Park on that front, I don't think. But the Park tab was amazingly influential, as we'll see. And so this, again, is the handheld one, right? Uh, this is well before Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or any of those kinds of things were invented. Uh, so they actually invented their own networking interface using infrared, uh, which is line of sight. So that real, was really awkward, right? Because if you had the device behind a box or something, they couldn't, they, it couldn't get a signal. Um, I guess nobody's ever used infrared for anything anymore. Uh, it used to be used for point-to-point -point communication. Uh, but nowadays we just use regular, oh, it's the kind of thing on your TV, right? So the TV remotes are all infrared, right? So if there's something blocking it, right, then the signal doesn't get through. Um, it had a touch sensitive screen and one of the most important pieces of research that was done on it was David Goldberg's invention of this language he called quick writing. And it had a number of really important innovations. So one is that um, on typical uh, machines of the time, as we'll see, they would make you hand print things. And everybody knows that hand printing, you type a letter and then you type the next letter next to it. And then the next letter next to that, the same way you'd print on paper. But one of the things that David and his colleagues realized 
is that with a computer writing, <coughs> you could write directly on top of each other. Right? So you type one letter, and then you put the next letter in exactly the same place. Then you never run out of room. So one of the problems with hand printing is when you get to the edge of the screen, right, then you have to wrap around back to the previous. And on a piece of paper, you know, you just keep going to the next line. But on a teeny little screen like this, you run out of room really quickly. Uh, so one of the things they invented that was part of quick writing is um, just doing it directly on top of each other. But then you have the problem, how do you know when you've ended one letter and started the next? Right? So if you type a, a vertical line in a regular printing, you don't know if that's supposed to be an I or the first stroke of a B. Right? You might type a line, and then you might go like this and make it a B, um, <coughs> or an X. You do one diagonal, what about the next diagonal, right? And so if you had a timeout, well, then the system has to wait for a while. And that's always annoying, because he doesn't know how long to wait. Uh, so his, uh, his, another part of his invention is to make it what he called unistrokes. So that means every character is a single stroke. So it, when you lift up the pen, it always knows you're done, right? And obviously, regular, um, Regular Latin letters, English letters, are not unistrokes. They're always, many of them are multiple strokes. And so he invented his own encoding of all of the different letters. And obviously, wasn't so easy to memorize all these letters. Um, <clears throat> but he basically tried to optimize it so the most common letters <clears throat> use the shortest strokes. Uh, so, you know, obviously it takes a little longer to make a V than it does to make a dot or a single line. And so the most common letters got the single lines. Uh, some letters try to look like what they are. So an S kind of looks like an S. Another thing he recognized is that on a piece of paper, if I draw an S one way, and if I draw it backwards, after you lift the pen with ink, they look identical. Because right? you can't tell from the ink which direction letters were drawn in. But of course, the computer knows where you started. And so he actually used exactly the same strokes for multiple letters based on the direction. Right? So U, or V is this letter, and U, uh, where is it? Yeah, and U is the same thing going backwards. Right? So just looking at them, if you had those strokes on paper, you couldn't tell the difference. But of course, the computer knows which one you meant. Um, so that was kind of the idea. Uh, some of these were a little more obvious than others. Uh, this chart shows how quickly you could write each letter. So a dot was for space. Uh, and E, again, is really short. And it went from less than 100 milliseconds up to like 350 milliseconds per character. So this was dramatically faster than you could hand print. And plus, if you did these strokes uh, like they were designed, then they would be almost 100% accuracy in terms of recognition rate. <coughs> and uh, so he presented this in 93. Uh, although the work had been done much earlier, he had a patent on it, which ended up being really important, uh, as we'll see in a few minutes. So meanwhile, approximately the same time, and uh, at the very end of this, uh, there are all these dates and times and stuff, and I. Uh, when all this stuff happened. So it got, I tried to put this talk in chronological order, uh, but then it got too confusing because we kept jumping around. And it makes sense to talk about like everything done at Xerox at once and everything done in the Palm Pilot at one time. And so I made a little, um, on the very last page, I, whoops, I made a uh, time, timeline. I found a, a program online that allegedly did timelines, but I noticed that it left out a bunch of the events. I can't figure out where they went. Like 3G isn't on here, even though it was in the database. Uh, so if anybody can find a better program for timelines, I have this database of all these events, and it would be useful to try and uh, you know, add some more stuff and, and things like that. So we're way over there on the left. We started with the tablet and the programmable computers uh, and the graphing calculators, and now we're talking about the uh, grid pad and, and things like that. So um, what slide was I on before? No. Um, so pen point um, is 
started a little before uh, this ubiquitous computing project, but they didn't release anything for quite a long time. This was one of the uh, great, um, you know, venture capital supported failures of the 80s. Um, the concept was they built a brand new operating system completely from scratch. It was an object oriented operating system. They got millions of dollars to uh, develop it and they had a whole bunch of employees. Uh, and Go was just going to be the software company. And they were going to let other people make the hardware, kind of the Microsoft model. And the hardware was made by NCR and IBM and a little company called EO. You can barely see that this tablet says Go. Uh, this was one of the early prototypes. These were enormous tablets. They weighed like five pounds. Um, you can imagine that would be a little uh, onerous to carry around. And there's some amazing concept videos that I have on the next slide uh, that I recommend you go see. They're pretty long, uh, but they're really interesting to see what the concepts are. Uh, so this is not, you know, this is not light or small. It was designed to be about the same size as a piece of paper, an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that, you know, was arm size. But the key thing uh, from our point of view is all the interaction techniques that were built into this pen uh, computer. Um, the concept was that it should be just like a regular notebook that would, you would use, uh, like a spiral notebook. Uh, you can kind of see that there are tabs along here. A lot of the interaction techniques were supposed to be familiar, so if you tapped on a button, you know, you would click the button and you could uh, um, do some other things like a regular um, computer. But they also invented a whole bunch of gestures for editing and stuff that, you know, nowadays we would find familiar. So they use flick to scroll and turn pages. So if you flick left or right, or up and down, it would do kind of the obvious things that we now expect. Uh, you could circle things to select them. So I could circle something and that would select it. Uh, if I made a little carrot symbol, uh, you know, a little upside down V, uh, that would be insert. So you could insert space. If I wanted to delete something, I could draw a little X over it and cross it out. Uh, there was a special uh, uh, thing for getting help. Uh, from the interface. It also had press and hold, which we're f familiar with from Android, where you press down and instead of just tapping, you press and hold for a while, and then you go into a different mode where new things can happen. Uh, in the Go pen point, it used that for moving and selecting and things like that, which is also uh, somewhat familiar. The text entry on this device was purely hand printing. Uh, which in all the videos, you know, works 100% of the time, but you can imagine in real life was not quite so successful. Uh, it also had hyperlinks, hyperlinks. And another thing that they had was instant on and off, which we all expect now from our phones, but we still don't expect from our laptops. So lots of the things that we're kind of used to uh, from gestures and interfaces and stuff like that are, are shown in this device. And, you know, again, whoops. It's back to 87 or 91, depending on which date you want to use. Uh, and I have links here in the PowerPoint to the actual manual uh, for how the system, uh, you know, uh, worked. And uh, here's some uh, close-up pictures from the manual. You can see the tabs for all your pages. Uh, that's supposed to represent a click. So if you clicked on a page number, it would, you know, jump right there. Um, and they also had interactions like circling things and so forth. So pretty, um, you know, advanced system. Um, unfortunately, it was well, way ahead of its time. The hardware was expensive and really heavy, short battery life, uh, which made it kind of impractical. And of course, the data entry using hand printing was pretty unsuccessful. Uh, another company uh, around the same time that was trying to do a similar thing was called GridPad. Uh, and this was founded by Jeff Hawkins, who we'll see is an important person later. And he was one of the people who was interviewed for the readings for today. Uh, so this was 89, and, and they were trying to design this hardware that uh, was another pen-based uh, input. So everyone in Silicon Valley at the time, or you know, in the community, 
was all excited about, you know, trying to provide handwriting recognition, trying to provide these portable pen-based computers. Uh, at the end of the 80s, uh, it seemed like that was going to be the next big thing. Uh, so the processor in this thing in 89, 20 megahertz, um, 20 megabytes of RAM, uh, the hard disk in here as well. Um, there was no such thing as flash memory at the time. Um, a 10 inch diagonal uh, screen with 32 grayscale. There is a PMC, PM, PCMCIA slot. Um, many, most computers don't have those anymore, but it's a big slot for cards. And you, I have a card that will go in. The line. Uh, so these big cards that you'd put in, um, and it only operated for three hours, even though it had this real big, heavy battery on it. So uh, that was obviously a big uh, problem at the time. So Microsoft got in this game um, with uh, a system they called Pen Windows. Uh, so basically, they just took Windows 3.1 and added some pen features to it. Uh, they didn't change the operating system very much, and that was one of the problems. But basically, any time you wanted to type, it would pop up this little panel, and you could hand print into the panel and use that instead of a typewriter. Or you could also push another button, and it would put up a soft keyboard, and you could tap on the keys, kind of like what we're used to doing now. Um, so it really wasn't very much different than 3.1, but it did have uh, some character recognition and you know, the, the problem for Grid and Go was, you know, people said, well, if I got pen windows, at least I'd be able to run Microsoft Office and all these applications I'm used to. If I run a Go machine or a Grid pad, you know, what am I going to be able to run on it? I'd have to write my application all over again in your operating system instead of using these guys' uh, versions. And so, Microsoft Pen Windows continued through NT and 95 and a bunch of the other uh, versions of Microsoft, um, still up until today with the Surface uh, versions. Um, and we'll see that there's another point at which Microsoft decided to actually focus on this a little bit. But at the time, Microsoft didn't put too much effort into it. They were just trying to you know, have something in this uh, market. Do you have a question? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I would, I'm not really sure whether the grid padding pen point. Um, there's a link to the entire manual here. Uh, so probably this says if there's a way to pop up the keyboard. It would be interesting to look that up. Um, I would be surprised if there wasn't because there's always something you want to enter that's not on the keyboard, like some weird character or something. Um, so there probably was, but I don't remember. It certainly wasn't one of the things they were emphasizing. If you look at the videos, they assume everybody's going to want to hand print everything. Okay, and so this brings us to the Apple Newton. How many people have heard of the Newton? Some people haven't. Um, so that's uh, the first device I actually have one of. It's actually not mine. It's this uh, Jason Hong's Newton. Um, so it's kind of a big device. Um, and this was... Um, a product of John Scully's at Apple. Uh, the first, well, when uh, Bill, I mean, when uh, Steve Jobs was forced out. So you probably know something of the history of Apple that uh, Steve Jobs helped found the company. Uh, and, the, and they, you know, through the Macintosh era, he was in charge of it, uh, that he wasn't a particularly good manager. He was always yelling at people and eventually he got forced out of the company and formed his own company called Next that we talked about last time. Uh, in that period of time, John Scully had taken over. He's the guy from Pepsi. Uh, and he ran the company for a few years there. Eventually, uh, Steve Jobs came back to Apple um, and revitalized it. Um, in this period where uh, Jobs was not affiliated with the company, they came out with this product called the uh, Newton, uh, Apple Newton, and it, 
Scully invented this term personal digital assistant or PDA for this kind of thing. So the idea was that this was clearly not a computer. For the previous, uh, like pen windows or the grid pad or the go pad, the concept was that was all you needed, right? It would do everything you needed to do. You're the kind of person who was always on the go. We're going to let you do everything you need to do with this big pad computer. Uh, this was the first time that people realized that there was no way that a little device like this was going to do everything you need. So it should pick some things and do them much better. And so uh, the concept was it would do things like calendaring and um, address books and a few other tasks uh, in a much better way than you, know, you could do with a PC on the fly. Um, these devices were fairly heavy, as you can probably guess. Um, I'll pass this around. This one doesn't go on. I mean, it still works. The interesting thing is all these rechargeable systems, right? Rechargeable batteries never last uh, very long. I mean, after a while, you can't, they don't take charges anymore. Uh, so none of these rechargeable devices will retain their charge anymore. Whereas like the Palm Pilot, which uses, uh, you know, tri uh, AAA batteries, this device works perfectly fine, right? Because all I had to do was put in fresh batteries. So that's kind of an interesting twist on um, power. So anyway, y you can try pushing the buttons on this, but it doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you want to see it later, we can plug it in and you can play with it. So this has a stylus uh, built in uh, that you had to use. Not really much to see except how heavy it is. Uh, obviously, that wouldn't fit in your pocket very well. Um, and you know it's kind of hard to carry around. It had a very interesting operating system. Again, this was totally new operating system. It didn't use the built, you know, the regular Mac, uh, Macintosh operating system or the Macintosh development environment. Uh, you probably know that the iPhone is programmed in the same language as the regular Macintosh in Objective-C and the development environment for both is the same. And so if you're a Macintosh programmer, you can probably do iPhone programming pretty well. At the time, that was not the case. It had a totally new environment called Newton. Newton script, uh, which is a prototype instance model, kind of like JavaScript, way ahead of its time. Um, it sort of contributed to this thing being kind of slow. Um, so for the programmers, uh, this is, might mean something to you. For everybody else, don't worry about it. It's just the concept that you know, all the applications for it had to be reprogrammed from scratch. One of the big problems with the device was the concept that the main way of doing input was going to be handwriting recognition. Uh, and this is script, you know, so connected writing. So I am writing a test sentence. And it didn't really work very well. Um, there was this group from Russia that they had, uh, that Apple had contracted or bought their handwriting recognizer. And, you know, it was trainable so that it got better and better. But it really wasn't that wonderful. And it made lots of errors. And one of the things uh, about this system and a lot of the others, as we'll see, is that when the system makes an error, there's no easy way to fix the error except by doing it again. And typically, that didn't really help. That it would, you know, if it was misunderstanding what you're saying, as you tried it over and over again, it just kept making errors uh, without getting any better. It wasn't an easy way to fix it. Uh, so Doonesbury, which is, you know, still running, is uh, spent an entire week making fun of how poor the handwriting recognition was on this device. Um, and that's, you know, kind of what everybody thought of this, right? It turned out the handwriting recognition wasn't that bad, especially for the time. And there was a pop-up keyboard. You could, you know, use other ways of interacting with it. Uh, but, you know, the advertisements and, you know, if you go to some of the ads, which um, are on YouTube, then uh, you can see that, you know, they really emphasized how natural it was. You could just do handwriting the way you were used to. And of course, that didn't work very well. Uh, so this is, you know, he writes, I am writing a test sentence. And it says, I am fighting atomic sentry. He tries it again. Ian is writing a taste sensation. He tries it again. I am writing a test sentence. Uh, so it finally got it catching on, egg freckles, right? So once you get one thing right, and then you try and do the next thing, then it doesn't somehow help at all. So 93, Newton comes out. It's generally 
uh, considered a failure. Although Apple did continue to support it for six years until eventually uh, when uh, Steve Jobs came back, he killed it because it really wasn't um, you know, that successful. Uh, meanwhile, um, so the original Newton actually didn't sync up with your laptop, uh, with your PC. And so eventually they realized that that was important. And you'll see that this guy doesn't actually have any interesting plugs besides the power plug, right? And so you put a bunch of stuff into that device and then the battery dies, all lost. So that was really stupid. Uh, and that was a problem with a lot of these old devices. So they didn't have flash memory that we're all used to now. So actually when the battery died, all the memory disappeared, except for the hard disk. And so a lot of these devices in this box, um, if, you, if you ever let the battery die all the way, then you had to restart everything from scratch, uh, which obviously made it very unattractive to put a lot of stuff in there if it didn't sync. So people realized that they really needed a way to sync. And so this was, uh, this device was designed specifically to sync over the air to, you know, using phone kind of technology or pager technology. Um, again, they built the whole uh, operating system from scratch in an object-oriented way. So this is the beginning of the object-oriented error for people who are programmers. Uh, C++ is just getting popular. <coughs> people had started to hear about small talk and things like that. And so this is the beginning of this object-oriented, um, I don't know, fad, if you will, although it certainly is, is continued. And so they built their own operating system from scratch. The cutest thing about Magic Cap was that this 3D interface, so everything you did tried to look like a real office. Um, turned out that's not particularly practical or useful, right? So the fact that it's a 3D picture instead of a 2D picture, you know, if it was 2D, you could fit more on the screen. Uh, so there really wasn't any advantage to that. Um, and it used a special wireless network that AT&T was providing uh, in order to do, um, you know, connectivity. It never really went anywhere. Uh, it's kind of just mainly uh, curiosity because of the uh, 3D screen. So everybody recognized so that, you know, every, mobile phones now have been around. You've seen on movies, so those enormous uh, phones, that uh, wireless phones, they call, used to call them car phones, things like that. And people recognized that it would make sense, instead of carrying a phone and a PDA, that you might want a combined device. And um, the first one that did that was in 1994, was the IBM Simon, which again is kind of an enormous device, uh, because you know hardware wasn't really up to these kind of things at that point. Uh, it, there was uh, one company, Bell South, which is no longer in existence, but it was basically AT&T for the South. Um, distributed this device for a little while, but no one really wanted it because it was too slow and uh, awkward to use. Uh, Nokia had its own version. Nokia is obviously the Finnish uh, phone company with one of the major manufacturers of handsets. Anybody have a Nokia phone anymore? Probably not. Um, anybody ever have a Nokia phone? So yeah, they used to be a big player, not so much anymore. Um, so they built this device that kind of looked like a regular phone on the outside, and you could open it up. So this opened up, and then they had a full keyboard on the inside. Uh, physical keyboard obviously was easier to use, uh, and it let you uh, do PDA functions like address books and calculators and stuff while being a phone. So that was in 96. Uh, all of these things basically um, suffered from having kind of slow connections. Uh, you know, this was the 1G error, uh, 2G maybe, uh, and the devices themselves had, you know, short battery life and things like that. So this brings us to the Palm. Um, how many people have heard of a Palm Pilot? Who hasn't heard of a Palm Pilot? Some people? You don't want to admit it. Um, so this is a Palm. This one works. Um, it's really easy to get a Palm to still work because they, like I said, they use AAA batteries. Um, so this is a Palm 3. The Palm 1 uh, was called the Pilot. 
uh, came out in 96. And there's a really interesting kind of long history if you go to Wikipedia or the book chapter on uh, the company. Uh, so Jeff Hawkins, who we saw before, uh, was one of the founders of GridPad, realized that GridPad wasn't going anywhere, uh, and struck off on his own uh, with a couple of other people. And they founded their own little company uh, called Palm, which was uh, quickly bought out by US Robotics, which was a modem company. I don't know why they thought they wanted that. Uh, US Robotics was then bought out by 3Com, which is a networking company. Um, eventually, um, Jeff and some of his colleagues got annoyed with 3Com, and so they uh, again broke off and formed their own company, which they called Handspring in 98. Um, eventually, Handspring and Palm realized that that was dumb to be competing, and so they recombined together uh, and bought the whole company away from 3Com, and then it was called Palm again, and it was actually had an IPO around 2000, just as the market was plunging, right? Uh, that was the uh, dot-com crash everyone's heard of that, you know, in the year 2000. Uh, so eventually they were not doing very well, and Hewlett Packard bought the whole company in 2010, uh, tried to make something of it for like a year and then gave up. And it basically was written off. And currently the only thing left of this company is a lot of patents. Excuse me. A lot of patents that they had on a lot of their technologies, which are currently being uh, uh, sued over. But anyway, um, back in 96, uh, they come up with this uh, PDA. Um, and there was an awful lot of improvements and a lot of um, basically user interface uh, things that they did in order to make this be a really popular product. Um, the original one, as you can see up there, is called a pilot. Uh, but it, it does have this stylus in it or a pen. And the uh, Pilot Pen Company, there's an actual company that makes pens called Pilot, uh, sued them. And so then they decided they weren't allowed to call it a pilot anymore. Uh, so this one is called a Palm 3. Uh, so they weren't, they had to give up the name Pilot, and so they just stuck with Palm. Um, so a lot of people still call them Palm Pilots, uh, but officially that's, they weren't allowed to, to do that after uh, this lawsuit. So one of the things from a HCI point of view that's interesting about these devices is that they did an awful lot of user testing. They did testing with physical prototypes, so they had some made out of balsa wood, and they tried different weights to see how much they could get away with. Uh, they wanted it to fit in people's pockets, so you know if you have a men's uh, shirts have uh, shirt pockets. Uh, they tried you know different uh, you know pants pockets and you know ladies' uh, uh, purses, and you know as it, wherever the um, the Newton went, right, that was uh, way too heavy for any of those kinds of things. You wouldn't even put the Newton in your pants pocket because it would pull your pants off. Uh, so the idea was to try and figure out the right weight for this. They also did a bunch of prototypes in HyperCard. We mentioned that last time as a prototyping environment uh, of what the user interface should look like. And so they did what we now would consider iterative design and prototyping uh, to figure out what the user interface should look like. Uh, the data entry. Uh, for this, uh, uses something called graffiti that Jeff had invented. Remember the quick writing that from the iPad? Uh, he had seen that and thought that he could do a better version of it by making it a lot easier to learn. Uh, so this is a unistroke alphabet except for X. <clears throat> they didn't want to do uh, a one-stroke X, so every other character is a single stroke. Um, and they try to look as much as possible like either the capital or lowercase version of the letter. And they refine this alphabet so that it would have a pretty high accuracy, right? So, and again, you do them on top of each other. And notice that the screen has these little niches, uh, nicks in it. And the idea is you put the letters over here and the numbers over here. And so that way, you can have the same stroke be an I and a one. So if you look at the I, it's a downward stroke, 
And if you look at the one, do I have the, oh yeah, the one right there is also a downward stroke. And the reason that those can work is that you did an I over here and a one over here. So that, um, you know, let you um, use the same strokes over again. Uh, they did have a mode for, for uh, punctuation. Remember, we talked about modes last time. So if you hit, uh, uh, if you go into punctuation mode, then, uh, then you get all these things. And they even had an extended mode where you could get all these European characters and umlauts and accents and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you could do everything with this uh, single uh, input technique. And so that was, you know, pretty popular. People got pretty fast with, uh, with uh, this alphabet, with graffiti. But you did have to learn it, right? You did have to. Uh, it's not like anybody would know this alphabet off the top of their head. It did take practice to get up to a reasonable speed. So you can try entering anything you want in this. Um, you can't really mess it up. Uh, you can try it, see if you can enter any of the letters. One of the things I really like about uh, the palm, and this was in the article that I had you read, uh, was that they really took a lot of this uh, human-centered design to heart, uh, which a lot of the other devices didn't. And so one of the things that was really important is that they studied the context of what people wanted handheld devices to be uh, for. What did you want to do with them? And so a lot of things are different than you might expect. So there are these four buttons down here. And they wanted to make them the four most common activities that people did. What would those be, right? So they did a bunch of user research to try and figure out, you know, what were the four things that people wanted? Uh, and it was the calendar, uh, the address book, and I forget what the other two are. One was notes. I don't remember what that was. Um, and somebody can actually see what the button does. Oh, it's a, it's a to-do list. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is to-do list, and this is like plain text notes. So they decided those were the ones that people would use this most, most of the time for. Um, another thing uh, is that when you go into an app, there's only room for like three buttons. Yeah, question? No, it didn't have handwriting recognition. It did have a pop-up keyboard. So if you tap in these little sections down here, it would pop up a keyboard and you could, you know, tap like a, you can on an iPhone. Well, they had drawing applications. You could draw a picture, but it wouldn't interpret it, right? So uh, one of the applications, I don't think it was one of the built-in ones, but there were certainly drawing programs and, you know, all sorts of things where you could just draw little pictures. Um, this, the whole thing is a touch screen, uh, so you can touch anywhere on the screen. Um, but there wasn't a handwriting recognition app for it. It was really too slow uh, to do that. Um, so what about the commands, right? So there are a whole bunch of commands in the menus of a PC. You know, the edit commands, the file, oh, there are all these menus. Um, Obviously, if you're going to have a gazillion menus on a thing, it's really awkward to figure out uh, where things are, and it's slow to get to them and so forth. So they had the idea that let's figure out the most important command and put that right in front of the user. And the interesting thing is that that makes executing commands um, not symmetric. So for some operations, there will be a button right on the screen to do it, and other operations will take three or four taps to get into the menus. So for example, if you're um, making a calendar entry, there's a button right on the screen for new calendar entry. There's a little button that says new. But if you wanted to delete a calendar entry, you have to go to the menus, and it's three or four taps to delete, uh, to delete an, uh, a menu event, I mean a calendar event. Well, it turns out, of course, that almost nobody ever deletes a calendar event, right? So uh, you know, eventually it's in the past, and you don't worry about it anymore. Right? And you really only delete events if it turns out it's canceled, which happens very rarely. 
And so uh, this observation that we don't need to do delete as easy as create uh, meant that you could figure out for a lot of the commands which ones should be front and center and which ones were okay to make it uh, far away and, and difficult to remove. Uh, they had the analogy of a stapler and a staple remover. You know, most people leave the stapler on top of the desk and the staple remover is in the drawer somewhere because you, you know, don't use that very much. Um, the other thing is that almost all apps on a PC, when you bring them up, they come up to the same way they were the last time you used them. So if you're in a Microsoft Word document and you close it and you bring it up, it always comes back to where you were. Instead, on the Palm, everything comes up and where it thinks you want to be. Right? And so in a calendar app, it doesn't care where you were the last time you were there. It always comes up to now. Because usually when you bring up a calendar, you want to know what I'm going to do next. Or, you know, I want to add something that's going to happen right now. Um, and so they tried to figure out for each of the applications, what would be the most useful thing that would let you get started right away? Because the concept is for a phone or a PDA, you pull it out of your pocket, you want to do something right away and put it back in your pocket. Whereas for a laptop, you almost always want to sit down and do something for half an hour. And so this context of use makes a big difference. It needs to be instant on, it needs to be uh, having the uh, operations right there at your fingertips. And so um, it's a very different philosophy also than like the Windows CE, which we'll talk about next, which had the philosophy of, well, everybody knows a PC, let's be similar. Let's make the uh, PDA work similarly to the way that people are used to from their PC. In the Palm, it was more like, let's figure out the optimal way of doing everything. So there were lots of different versions of Palm over the years. Uh, there was a Palm Watch, which was announced in 2002, uh, but didn't actually ship until a year later. Um, it was um, by a company called Fossil, which still is around. Uh, it had a 160 by 160 screen. Uh, there was a stylus, cute little stylus, that was um, hidden in the back of the, um, of the, um, band that pulled out right here. This, I think this is it. So you'd pull this out and then you could use this as this little teeny stylus um, so that you could actually get to, you know, little pieces of it. But other than that, it was pretty standard uh, Palm features. You could run all the same Palm apps as you could on the regular Palm Pilot. Um, the key problem was, of course, that the battery lasted for six hours, which really isn't particularly useful in a watch, right? Uh, you certainly really want your watch at least the last 24 hours or so you can bring it home and charge it up at night time. Uh, so that was kind of a flop. Uh, and, you know, at the battery technology of the time and the kind of screen it had, um, it was always off. Um, so they made a bunch of other versions of the Palm. Um, so... Um, this is um, an industrial version of the Palm Pilot. You can see it's a similar Palm uh, input area down at the bottom. That's one of the ways you can tell it's a Palm. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention one other thing about Palm Pilots that was really important. How many people know what this kind of connector is? Nobody? Anybody know what this is? It kind of looks like a monitor plug, but it's not. It's a serial plug, okay? So one of the things that the uh, original Palm had that I forgot to mention is from the very beginning, it came with a dock. And it wasn't for recharging because I remember the Palms used the AAA batteries. It was to sync your, all your data with your PC or Macintosh. And so you'd plug this into your PC and, um, and most PCs had a serial plug on them uh, at the time. And it, this is uh, basically nine pins, which is eight bits plus a parity bit, so it could, uh, you know, check and make sure the data came across correctly. It was pretty slow, uh, but it did allow everything that was on the Palm to be uploaded automatically to the PC just by pushing this one little button, right? And so the advantage of that was that you could 
make sure that you never lost all your data on the Palm. And that if you had a calendar program on your PC, then uh, all your calendar you know, data would be synchronized all the time. Sounds pretty obvious today, but at the time, that was pretty revolutionary. Because the Newton didn't do that. None of the previous devices had really treated this device as just a, you know, accessory to your PC and made sure you never lost any data. And so serial ports were a, a key uh, advantage. Anyway, I was saying about this guy, they took the Palm Pilot and they put it in this case, which is uh, industrial strength. Uh, this is designed to be dropped, uh, to be strong enough that it can be dropped from four feet onto concrete. Although I won't let you actually try that because this is not replaceable. And it has a laser, laser scanner in the front. Um, so, you know, like you see in the supermarket that would scan barcodes or 3D, 2D barcodes or things like that. And so the idea is that this was for supermarkets and things like that, so they'd walk around and uh, scan the stuff on the shelves and, or, you know, warehouses and things like that. So this is a company called Symbol. And Symbol is actually the same people who make Giant Eagles barcode scanners now. If you look at their devices, it says Symbol. Um, so the company still exists, and for a while they made handhelds uh, around the Palm. And what I'm showing on the screen are some of the first Palm phones. And I actually had, I had a, a, a Kyocera phone like that one. Um, so it looked like a regular phone when it was closed. And then this part flopped, you know, flipped over, and then it was a regular Palm Pilot. Uh, so that was kind of clever. Uh, what the buttons actually did was there was a little sensor that detected that the thing was closed, and these buttons actually, uh, you know, pressed, but pressed uh, you know, caused it to do phone functions. Uh, this is a later model uh, where the Palm Pilot screen is on the top, and they put the graffiti area on the bottom, right? So they just kind of separated it into two pieces. Um, it turned out there were some gestures that required you to stroke through both pieces. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of awkward. Because uh, on every previous phone, they were contiguous touch panels, so that was easy. But on this one, it didn't actually work. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's basically like a phone separate from a Palm Pilot, but they're uh, put together. I guess I can pass these around too. The thing that happened was that people got tired of um, typing graffiti. People weren't learning graffiti. And meanwhile, as we'll get to in a minute, the RIM BlackBerry, how many people have heard of BlackBerry? How many people's fathers had a BlackBerry? Right? It was really uh, common with uh, uh, business executives and lawyers. And everybody had BlackBerries at the time, uh, they had invented or at least popularized this little keyboard, the thumb keyboard, which now everybody calls the BlackBerry keyboard. Um, so that was starting in 99. Uh, so going back to Palm, everyone was saying, oh, it's so much easier to type on these little thumb keyboards. Uh, I'm tired of using graffiti. That seems a lot slower and it's harder to learn. And so Palm decided to come out with uh, versions of the Palm Pilot that gave up on the graffiti area and instead used the little keyboard. And the most popular one was uh, the combined trio, uh, which was a Palm Pilot with a little keyboard uh, and no graffiti at all. So they basically took the graffiti area, got rid of it, and this part ran the regular Palm software, except to use this little keyboard for doing input. Um, and so that was around 2002. So graffiti got to be uh, discontinued. Uh, there was also a problem that uh, Xerox sued Palm about the uh, graffiti alphabet um, since they could show that Jeff Hawken had seen their, graffiti, their uh, quick writing software. They had a patent on quick writing. Uh, they sued Palm over this quick writing concept, and their patent was general enough that it covered <coughs> graffiti. And so actually, Palm had to stop supporting graffiti anyway, 
So that gave them extra motivation to switch to uh, this little keyboard instead of using uh, um, instead of using graffiti. So there were a bunch of people who had learned graffiti, mostly kind of early adopter kind of people, uh, but most people find that they're faster on a keyboard like this. Uh, so here's some more. This was actually my phone. I mean, I used this. I used the Carosera phone and this phone uh, for years until it got to be silly um, as my you know, main phone device. I guess I have to go a little faster. Um, Windows CE was Microsoft's attempt to try and copy all this uh, successful uh, behaviors. So CE 1.0 was released in 96, which was the same year as the Palm Pilot. Um, just like kind of other Microsoft stuff, the first version wasn't very successful or popular, uh, but CE 2.1 was a particularly successful one. And they had two versions of it. Uh, so Windows CE Compact Edition, then they named it Windows Palm PC. That was uh, immediately sued by Palm Pilot, uh, the Palm Company. So they, weren't, they only had the Palm name for like a few months before they had to abandon that. And then they called it Pocket PC. And so they came out with two versions. One in this vertical, which looked a lot like Palm Pilots. Um, and this is a color one, so that was a little bit later. Um, it's kind of this device. And then a horizontal one. which was really awkward to carry around. But it does have this, you know, a regular keyboard on it. And that's, oops. Um, so I think both of these work again, but they have to be plugged in because the batteries are pretty much dead. Uh, so it was the same operating system, but you can imagine if you wrote software for this one, uh, it wouldn't run very well on this one. So most people who wrote software had to pick one or, you know, write code that was pretty general purpose. Uh, CE was instant on. So it, um, you know, when you push the on button, they, they came on immediately. Um, the um, eventually people got quite fast processes. So this was the IPAC. Uh, who, who's heard of the company called Compaq? Uh, eventually, Compaq bought an old company called Digital Equipment Corporation. Got all their software, um, and they came out with a handheld device this one called the IPAC, which almost all researchers immediately bought because it was really fast. Uh, and there were all sorts of things you could plug into this port down here. Uh, like it had the wire, it was the first device that had wireless that you could plug into it. Uh, there were all sorts of fun things people put around the outsides and you could write software for it pretty easily. And since it was so fast, you could write, you know, kind of sloppy code and it would do interesting things, um, which is useful for researchers. Uh, so this was a really popular model for a while. It's not a phone, so these are just PDAs. Um, there was uh, an article in the thing about uh, their user studies, and I think the most telling thing about their user studies is they did all this user study research which showed them the way it should be and they ignored it, right? So they said, the user test showed that they really needed to have a 10-point bold font in order to be big enough for people to hit. But they decided that uh, they really wanted to put more buttons on the screen than people could actually fit or feel or hit, so that they went with a 9-point font instead. Right? And so what they're saying is that the engineering requirements of putting a zillion buttons on the screen at the same time was more important than having a good usability. Um, they had their own character recognizer, uh, which was kind of like graffiti, but most people use the pop-up keyboard uh, instead. And uh, none of those devices will go on. Oh, but the stylus, and they all had styluses. These are resistive screens. Uh, that's one kind of technology that will uh, detect a point, uh, but obviously only detects one point at a time. Uh, so RIM uh, is an imp important company, uh, came out originally with this uh, little device that was an email reader and pager. And <coughs> they had their own custom uh, network. Uh, so the, and it, it's a Canadian company. So in Canada and the US, there was a custom um, radio network 
that would let you get your email, and this was long before you could do that on any other kind of device, you could get your email and you could send email with their little keyboard, um, and you know, so you could stay in touch. And so that was their key um, reason for being, is that they had their own servers, their own email, uh, they would connect into your corporate email at work and let you get your email on the fly, on the, on the road. In terms of interactions, this is not a touch screen. Uh, the original design used these little uh, rollers that were on the side and eventually in the center. Uh, so instead of having a touch screen, you use this roller to get to all of the uh, buttons and uh, things to choose from. Uh, and so that a lot, they have a bunch of early patents on how to use a roller as the key way of doing interactions. It wasn't until quite late that they became uh, devices that you could use on regular phones. Originally, you would have to have a phone in your pocket and separately a BlackBerry device in order to get your email. Um, and it wasn't until, I'm not sure when, that they actually combined into like the Verizon phone uh, BlackBerry network. And it still was using two separate networks for a while until eventually the phone networks caught up and you could just use uh, the one network. Eventually, after the iPhone came out, they tried to have a full screen device that didn't have the cute little keyboard on it. Um, and the original design was really awful. Uh, and no one liked it. It was quickly discontinued. Um, another problem with BlackBerry is that they have a pretty awkward API for third party applications as opposed to the iPhone or Android. And so if you wanted to write an application for the RIM devices, you'd have to uh, you know, write it separately. Uh, jumping back uh, to other phones, um, the original, uh, you know, uh, mobile phones started to have display screens around 93. Um, sometimes these are called feature phones. And originally people were trying to make phones smaller and smaller. So the Razer, the Motorola Razer, how many people remember that? Uh, was this really cool, very thin phone. Right? It had a fairly large display, um, but it was uh, incredibly thin. And so everybody was trying to make thinner phones uh, that had uh, a reasonable number of features, but these were not touch screens. And all of the interactions were done uh, with these uh, arrow keys and with the uh, phone keypad. And so text entry was done in something called uh, multi-tap, using the letters that are on the keys, right? Anybody? Remember using multi-tap? Right? Uh, so if I wanted to B, I'd type this twice. If I wanted an E, I'd type this twice, that kind of thing. Um, there was also something called T9, which tried to guess what you wanted from the keys. So if I type, you know, 223, it would say, well, that could be B, A, D. It could be B, E, C, you know. So it would take all the combinations of the letters and see which one seemed to be most common. And then it would guess uh, which letter you wanted. Um, so that was what you had to do for text entry. Um, they eventually had web browsers on these tiny phones. As you can imagine, that was pretty hard to use. And so they had custom web pages that would be for phones instead of regular web pages. And there was a protocol called WAP for wireless access protocol that tried to provide features that you might want on web pages on these old phones. Pretty unsuccessful, had terrible use usability problems, uh, eventually they were pretty much all abandoned. So people were still thinking styluses were the way to go, uh, that handwriting was a big thing. Uh, this is uh, Bill Gates in 2002 saying the tablet PC is going to be the revolution in uh, you know, computing. It was another flop. Um, they had handwriting recognition again which was obviously better than the Newton, since this is many years later, but it still was not very successful. Um, and it turns out that most people didn't want to do handwriting for text entry anyway, for data entry anyway. Um, the user interface, as you can see here, is pretty much the same as on a laptop. You know, it's these little bitty buttons that you have to press with a stylus. You couldn't imagine doing this with your finger because all of the targets were tiny. And the difference between a mouse and a pen 
is that if you ever used a pen on these devices, there's a certain amount of jitter. So the cursor is always moving around just a little bit. But that's enough to make it really hard to hit these tiny little targets. And there's also not a right button on a pen, right? There's press down, but where's the right button, right? Uh, and so a lot of the interactions that you're used to from a PC didn't work out very well on these tablet PCs. I threw in the dates for the different uh, networks, and obviously it wasn't until we got 3G around 2001 that internets on, or the data transfers on phones got to be fast enough to be useful. Uh, 1G was actually analog. Uh, so anybody remember old-fashioned modems that used to go right? Or like faxes still do. What they're doing is encoding digital information into an analog phone sig signal, right? And so that's what they did with the original 1G was actually use analog, uh, the phones, the, you know, wireless phone signal with digital data overloaded on that, which was really slow. Uh, so eventually they said, oh, that's really dumb. Let's just have a separate digital signal. And that's where that started in uh, 92 with the, um, with the 2G. And, and then over the years, they just tried to make it faster and faster. And so there's the different, um, you know, generations they're called. Second generation, third generation, fourth generation. Uh, fifth generation is going to be super fast. You know, who knows uh, when that will count. And then there's the American and the European version. CDMA is the one from Motorola that Verizon and Sprint uses. And GSM is used by everyone else in the whole world um, that AT&T and T-Mobile use. Uh, so that's one of the reasons those phones won't work on each other's networks. Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, oh, this is, a, this is another Windows machine that I have. Um, it also uh, has a flip screen. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's kind of like Surface computers, you know, that, that flip around. Uh, but this is pretty heavy, too. I tried to give a talk with this for an, like an hour, right? You know, using this for like an hour standing up, and you can imagine my arm was really tired. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of the issue with these big devices, heavy devices. They were intended to be walking around kind of devices, but your arm breaks off if you try and use them for that amount of time. And that's really... Oh, the other thing I have in the box is a brand new um, Pebble watch. Seems pretty useless, um, <laughs> but um, it has a pretty nice screen. It uses um, it uses the same kind of technology as the Kindle, so allegedly it doesn't take as much battery power. But I charged it up full power two days ago, and you can see the screen is dark, so it doesn't have a very long battery life either. Um, so Wi-Fi, wireless networking, they were all used to. was originally called 802.11, which is a catchy name. Uh, it's just the number of the IEEE standard that standardized it. Um, there have been all sorts of versions. started kind of slow. It was called Waveland originally. And um, you could plug it into devices like the Clio that I'm passing around. It has a plug where you could put in a wireless network. So CMU was really ahead of its time with Wireless Andrew, which was putting Waveland everywhere. Um, and the uh, Wi-Fi trademark came in in about 99. And uh, Bluetooth uh, was actually a European uh, invention from Ericsson, which is a phone company in somewhere in Scandinavia. I forget where. Denmark, maybe? Um, and the name is actually Danish as well. It's the nickname for a Danish king that, you know, tried to uh, unite all of Scandinavia. And the idea of Bluetooth was it was going to unite all of your devices so that they could talk to each other without a lot of wires. And so that's where the name comes from. Um, the idea of Bluetooth is to be really low power. The original application was, you know, ear sets to your phone, right? So anybody has a wireless headset? It's using Bluetooth. It's really low power. Uh, but nowadays, we use it for you know mice, wireless mice, wireless keyboards. These are all Bluetooth because it's really low power. Uh, instant on, it's exactly two devices. So it has this pairing thing. <coughs> so it's a lot more secure. <coughs> so you know if you have your mouse connected to your keyboard, I mean, to your PC, 
You don't want somebody else sneaking in with their keyboard and starting to type on your screen, right? And so the fact that it's one-to-one -one is really important and that it uh, remembers who it's talking to. Um, so that's uh, started in 94, came out in 2002. Um, obviously really important for today's devices. So uh, there's a bunch of stuff about the iPhone and Android and things, which I think I'll just wait and cover next time. Uh, since we have another lecture, uh, I can cover some of this before we get into desktop stuff. So one thing to think about um, for next time, in addition to the new material that we're going to cover on desktop machines, is this question of, of all the things I talked about, what is really new on the iPhone? And no fair looking ahead and cheating. Uh, you know, what is it that uh, has been invented by um, Apple on the iPhone that we haven't seen in all of the previous things that we've talked about? And what were the interesting interaction techniques uh, that we didn't see on all these devices that are going around that were invented by the iPhone? So we'll talk about that next time along with you know, giving an overview of the history of desktop interactions. And I need all my toys back.